Hi there guys, come on in. Welcome to the Holy Shed, the tiniest parish in Christendom, right here at the bottom of our garden. Now, as you know, it was All Souls Day on Thursday. That's the day in the church calendar when traditionally we remember absent friends, our loved ones who we've lost along the way. And Pat and I uh, are still remembering our dear friend Sophie, Sophie Savage, who died almost exactly two years ago in October 2021. I met Sophie because she and her husband John wanted to have their three-year-old daughter baptised. And so, as you do, they hot-footed it down to the local parish church uh, to see the vicar. And, well, it didn't go quite as straightforwardly as they had hoped. Uh, whilst they weren't regulars in church, he did agree uh, to baptise Gabriella. And all was fine, until, that is they revealed that two of their four proposed godparents were not Christians. One was Jewish, the other Hindu. And he explained that he wouldn't be able to go ahead. Well, undeterred, they decided instead to organise a naming ceremony in the garden. Thankfully for me, at least, I hope for them too, a mutual friend pointed them in my direction. So, hey, the naming ceremony didn't happen and I got the gig. The said godparents, I may say, were not Christians, but I've seen a lot of godparents in my time, and I would say they were excellent godparent material. Others maybe who can tick a box saying Christian, hmm, not necessarily so much. And incidentally, they were very happy to support and encourage Gabriella in her Christian faith if that was what she chose. They weren't trying to convert her into Hindu, a Hindu or a Jew. Well, it was an unforgettable day, a Sunday afternoon service uh, in St Luke's Church and afterwards we shared a fun meal in the nearby tapas bar where I had so many marvellous conversations with people who were not conventionally religious but beautiful and spiritually wide open. They were just lapping up everything I had to say, which I think is probably not a bad thing, don't you? Anyway, a couple of weeks later, I received a card from Gabriella, penned, of course, by her mummy, but um, it read like this. She said, thank you for my very special christening with the lovely songs and candles. I may not remember it, but Mama says my spirit will, and it marked my soul in some way. I don't know what she means, but it made her and Dada happy, so I'm happy too. I am a very blessed girl because my life is full of love and special people like you. I mean, what do you do when you get a card like that through the post, unexpectedly? And Sophie added, I hope this card will remind you of the young soul you served with that wonderful service at St Luke's. <sighs> wow. Absolutely wonderful. But then, a year or so later, in 2014... Sophie was diagnosed with stage four cancer and told that she had months to live. Uh, I mean, devastating news for anyone, of course, but for the mother of a lovely young child, well, I'll tell you what, let me allow Sophie to tell you a little bit about it. I had tumours in my lungs, lymph nodes, spine, ribs, shoulders, and more in my brain than they could count. That was my darkest hour, um, when he said, we ha you have more brain tumours than we can count. Um, so it was, uh, it brought me to my knees. It brought me to my knees. I was on my knees with grief, more than fear. I'm not af so afraid of dying. I'm afraid of leaving my kid to grow up without, without me. My daughter was four years old and it seemed like I wasn't going to get to raise her. There were some turning points. I remember my oncologist saying, you need to have urgent whole brain radiation. And by now I was losing my eyesight and my language and I was in real trouble, but my intuition went, no, I need to educate myself. And the second major turning point was when a nurse, this was in an NHS hospital at this point, 
she hands me my appointment for my first radiotherapy session and I didn't know how counterculture this was at the time or controversial <laughs> and I don't make a habit of it but I looked at it and I knew my kid had something going on at school that day and I remember telling myself if I fit my life into cancer I'm going to die very soon but if I fit cancer into my life I might have a life, even if it's only for six months, but I need to do this according t to my own terms. And I said to the nurse, I'm sorry, but I'm not free that day. And I mean, she was, it just, I didn't know you didn't do that, but it was so psychologically important for me because I took my power back that day. What a woman. I mean, Sophie always knew that the disease would, would likely kill her. But you know what? She ended up having another seven precious years more than she was told. And she made a massive impact on thousands of people living with cancer. At her 50th birthday party, which she wasn't expected to reach, her oncologist said that Sophie was rewriting the narrative of cancer, especially in her passionate opposition to, you know, what she called the battlefield language, the language of fighting cancer, battling with it, losing the battle, uh, which all of which she considered to be toxic and very unhelpful. I'm living with cancer, she said, not battling it. And if you want to know more about that, her book, the Cancer Whisperer is still available and for anyone who is affected by cancer, uh, directly or indirectly, I heartily recommend it. It is an incredible read and it, it was uh, Sunday Times uh, award winning book, The Cancer Whisperer. But you know what? Sophie not only rewrote her narrative of cancer, she also challenged the dominant model of Western medical care, which historically has tended to treat a body or particular organs within a body rather than treating the person as a whole. It's, it's that old Cartesian dualism of body and mind which has cast a shadow over modern science and medicine, as well as theology, by the way, for hundreds of years. Sophie didn't buy it. She didn't buy into that kind of dualism. She insisted on being seen and heard and treated as a whole person. And I think she was dead right. Whatever's going on in one part of life is inextricably linked to all the parts that make up the whole. Body, mind, emotions, spirit, relationships, all of these things. Sophie stood firm and strong for a holistic approach, rooted in her belief that everything and everyone exists in relationship to everything and everyone else. And in that way, she believed that support and prayers of people could also make a difference, could be part of the picture. <coughs> Excuse me. And all of this uh, is absolutely tied up with and linked to the theological issues that we have been discussing discussing in the shed in recent weeks process theology uh, which as i've made clear is also could also be thought of as relational theology because in line with the findings of modern science and cosmology process theology holds that everything in life in the universe actually is connected to everything else reality is intrinsically relational, relational through and through, right down to the bottom. Of course, ancient communities have known this. They have a much greater awareness of this uh, relationality <coughs> and wholeness. But uh, arising from the 18th century Enlightenment period, the modern Western outlook has been dominated by dualism and binary thinking. But you know what? All of this is certainly now changing. The old dualistic and materialist approach to medicine is being eclipsed by 
a relational and spiritual vision of reality. Sophie very powerfully demonstrated that mental and emotional attitudes, spiritual beliefs, spiritual practices, including uh, the prayers of others, can have an impact on physical symptoms and outcome, outcomes. Now, of course, this is not to say that positive attitudes, friendship, prayer, complementary, complementary therapies or whatever can necessarily uh, secure a cure. I mean, I mean, that said, who am I to say? But they, what I do know is they certainly may improve a person's physical conditions. Uh, it, it, it may ease or even reverse symptoms, slow down the spread of disease, as it did with Sophie, and at the very least transform the whole experience of living with illness. And uh, this is increasingly recognised within the caring professions. And I think that due to her holistic approach and the support and prayers of others, Sophie lived far longer. And more importantly, she actually lived her life with cancer for many years longer than was predicted or expected. She didn't find a final cure, uh, but I think she did find healing. And at her 50th birthday party, radiant, elegant, and gorgeous. Sophie announced, people, we are all terminal. Something is going to get us all. And everyone applauded heartily. But she believes strongly that life did not need to end with a diagnosis. And that comes out quite strongly in, in the little film clip we had of her. And that things like love and hope and prayer could make a significant difference. Um, for me, having journeyed with uh, prayer from naive certainty about prayer to chronic and severe doubt about it, and then to what I would call sceptical belief about prayer, I find that prayer only really makes sense to me within this context of a radical relatedness in all reality and that God is part of that relationality. So yes, despite maintaining a healthy, sceptical attitude, I do pray all the time. I long and yearn in prayer. I shout and holler in prayer sometimes. I struggle in prayer. I call upon God from the bottom of my heart, not expecting magic tricks, not expecting simplistic answers, but as a way of expressing my deepest joys and longings. It's how I align my whole self to what I instinctively sense are the longings and joys of God. And of course, none of this has anything to do with notions of a, you know, big guy up there, a supernatural heavenly controller. Uh, it's got nothing to do with me trying to persuade him to, you know, respond to my wishes, to shift his his uh, attention and will toward what it is that I'm asking. None, none of that stuff makes the slightest bit of sense to me. And the picture of a God with, you know, the kind of macho power to do anything, who is also, on the other hand, all loving. Well, it just boggles the mind, as I've been saying in recent sheds. I mean, what sort of God, really? I think the God revealed in Jesus is part of the struggle. Part of the process is in there. That's what the cross is shouting more than anything else in Christian tradition. God is part of this. God is in this. God is struggling and suffering with us, but also opening up pathways of hope and resurrection and newness. And that's, of course, the good news of the Christian message. But... Um, <clears throat> I do believe passionately in the God who is all love, whose power is the power of love, um, the one in whom all things hold together, as Paul puts it, in deep uh, and profound interconnectedness, the God whose power is love, wooing, enticing and persuading us into hope and healing and newness, not controlling us or the world. 
I do find St Paul offers the most persuasive theological image of God when he describes God as that in which we live and move and have our being. God, according to this, is the all-embracing divine energy or life-giving spirit out of which everything is created, born and sustained. The world is in God and God is in the world. It's relational, as I say, all the way down. So according to this, God, the creative source of all love and goodness, relentlessly calls and prompts the world toward its better and higher possibilities, toward health and well-being on all levels, personal, collective and global. And this calling and prompting is the lure of God that I mentioned, I think, last time. We individually, and the world as a whole, is constantly being lured by God toward love and goodness, toward wholeness and wellness on all levels. And it's completely up to us as individuals, as communities, as a world, as to how we respond to that great calling, that lure of God. And in some wonderful, mysterious, reciprocal way, God needs our response, our cooperation, our collaboration. That's what relationality is all about. And, you know, we don't need to be Christians or even religious people at all to respond positively to the lure of God. It's, it's an attitude of heart. It's openness of spirit to that which brings life and hope and liberation to the world. It's not about, you know, believe these six things, these six impossible things before breakfast. It's about life. It's about how we are as people. And sometimes I think, you know, religious people become delightful gateways for this to happen. Other times, <clears throat> I think religious people are blockages to the flow of life. Often people without any conscious faith whatsoever completely show us the way. And of course, that's what, you know, my book, How to Be a Bad Christian and a Better Human Being, is really all about. So back to where we began. In this world of deep and radical relationality, what we do or say or think or pray makes a difference. <clears throat> and whichever way we interpret it, God appears to need us in the ongoing creation of the world. We're part of a great cosmic dance, co-creators of goodness and liberation in the world with God. And this is how I see prayer and why I continue to pray. I see prayer as another drop of experience, a little microcosm of life. Each moment is just that, isn't it? Prayer is like a drop of experience, a here and now event that can be woven into the whole web of unfolding history, a way of aligning our whole beings with the divine direction toward healing in the world. I don't expect prayer to have some obvious instant result any more than I expect passionate commitment to social change, yielding immediate outcomes in the world. But, but things do change. You know, um, Berlin walls do fall. Apartheid regimes do crumble. People told to expect a few more months to live do sometimes get another seven years. I believe in miracles in the sense that wonderful, incredible things do occur. Um, not as sort of outside interventions cutting across nature, as it were, but as expressions of divine life interacting with and fundamentally working within nature. When I think about and uh, and and how one single seemingly random action or event can you know change change history uh, alter the course of a person's life or the lives of countless others then then i catch a glimpse 
of what radical relationality means, how our choices, our longings, our prayers as intentional alignments with God's loving purpose for the world may indeed be vital links in a whole chain, releasing divine energy, you know, in a way that may otherwise have not been possible. Kind of does my head in, really, but, uh, you know, kind of makes me very excited and awestruck at the prospect that I and you and we as people can be genuine agents of change, not mere spectators uh, or hopers that God will come down and do something, but genuine agents of change in the world. I think that's pretty amazing, don't you? Meanwhile, I'll keep praying for the other Sophies in my life or that I become aware of. Um, I'll keep doing everything I, I can practically do for them as well. Keep on keep on praying for Israel-Palestine. Keep writing to my MP. Keep actively pursuing peace in all sorts of ways in the world. Keep spreading goodness and love wherever I can. And roll into that whole sort of weaving together of responses to the lure of God. I think that prayer uh, you know, still makes sense to me in that context of relationality. Okay, well, I'm going to come to a prayer now. And it's autumn, isn't it? <coughs> so it's nice to have some autumn colours and some leaves and a prayer. God of autumn sun, of cloud and rain, of misty mornings, crisp blue skies, of brown wrinkled leaves, ground covered in seeds, of blackbirds singing as night descends. God of thick woolly jumpers, wellies and scarves, of buttered toast, jam and pots of hot tea. God of bonfires, pumpkins and candles ablaze, of dogs chasing squirrels that we pray will survive. God of memories so precious, still warm in our hearts, of loved ones departed yet present within. God of things that we've lost, yet somehow still have, of hope burning bright when there's nothing to see. God of constant new becomings, of drops of life that can change everything, of seeming coincidence and happenstance. Help us to be doorways to a world reborn. Our souls are so grateful to be here, alive, to share in this pageant of season and change, to know that in all which passes or dies lives a shout of great joy waiting to be born. Amen. <clears throat> so, I think a little toast is required. I mean, I've, I've got some water here, which, as you can tell, I need. <clears throat> but whatever it is that you've got to hand, I invite you now to just join me very briefly in a toast. A toast to absent friends. We all have them. A toast to loved ones who are still here with us in a different way. A toast to hope that mysteriously transcends this mortal coil and calls us to live this life with all the gusto and panache that we can possibly muster to life. L'chaim. Thank you so much, guys, for being here with me today uh, for another Holy Shed. I hope that you found that interesting, stimulating. You don't have to agree with everything I say. That's not the point of this. Uh, I do hope that you go away from the Shed always with something to think about. Um, I've left so many churches, to be honest with you, with nothing to think about. I hope that the Holy Shed, this littlest parish, is somewhere that makes us think, maybe, you know, stirs up a response in us emotionally, whether of anger or great joy. And if you like it all anyway, if you like what I'm doing here in the Shed, you can support us. You can buy us a coffee. The link is here on the screen before you. And uh, it's very easy to do. And we are deeply grateful for all the coffees <laughs> that you 
uh, give to us all the other words of encouragement as I often say um, I thrive on encouragement so you can keep that coming too and there it just about is um, I hope that you will have a wonderful week whatever it is that you're up to um, go out into the world with that sense that you're an agent of change and not just a spectator on things round about you and kindness is probably one of the greatest um, acts of transformation that we can bring into the world. So go well, stay human. I'll see you soon. And I'll finish here with this blessing.